Uh, so the, the, the subject is uh, it's sort of it's it, it, it's it's uh, I had a book written with Corey Boatwright. Many of you know uh, Corey helped me. Uh, the content is mine. Corey really helped me orchestrate it, and I, and I wrote the book uh, essentially asking these top ten questions, and uh, th these are real basic, real straightforward questions, but it'll help you analyze a fund or a deal. So let me let me get started. This is for educational purposes only. Uh, so that's, and you can read the disclaimer. A couple of words about me. Um, married, you can see the picture with uh, four kids. A cat is not in the picture. Another time I'll uh, have a picture of the cat. But I have a very, very cute cat. It's a Russian blue mix with a Scottish fold. Um, I'm a CEO of TF Management Group. Uh, I co-manage two funds, our Legacy Fund, TF Investment Fund 2, and then we have the... Uh, our best flagship fund, Temp Opportunity Fund. I'm a retired software executive, spent almost 14 years in the industry, and moved on uh, to what I uh, absolutely love to do. My passion is real estate. It's sort of a combination of everything I enjoy. And um, uh, so I went to the real estate part-time, buying properties in uh, New York, and then diversified into other things, and then became full-time fund manager to 2009. Uh, our specialty and focus, and this is a lot of experience, uh, my, my personal experience is in short-term bridge loans, loans and fix and flip projects, and also uh, value add uh, long-term equity deals with uh, predictable cash flow and uh, value add forced appreciation. Some of the sectors that, that, that I will talk a little bit about, self-storage, multifamily, retail, office, and single family, obviously. Keep going. So here's a list of top 10 questions, and I'm not gonna go through every single one here, uh, but these are real basic questions, and they're not formulated as questions, they're formulated as statements, but they cover key content. And then there's some advanced questions as well. And the purpose of asking these questions is for you to understand before you make the investment, what you're getting yourself into. There's, uh, it's very easy to pull the trigger, get yourself into a deal, and then wind up uh, with a difficult deal, bad deal, unfair deal, and whatnot. So let me jump into the uh, crux of the presentation. Number one question, how secure is your is the investment or your investment? So this is the fundamental question. There's a lot to be said about it, and I'll tell you right away. The moment somebody tells you it's guaranteed, um, run away. I mean, that the, the, there's two things guaranteed in life, death and taxes. Everything else, there's some level of risk. So understanding risk is really important. Um, but safety comes from, from a couple of things. And number one of, the, one of these things is leverage. And the reason I want to mention leverage uh, is because it works both ways. When markets go up, leverage helps you magnify your returns. When markets go down, leverage can sink you. So when you look at the safety of the investment, the first question you should, you should ask is the fund uh, or a syndication leverage. If it is leverage, it doesn't mean it's bad, but the higher the leverage, the higher the risk. It's, it's that simple. So having a big leverage means uh, a lot of risk if things go wrong. Very, very simple uh, thing to pay attention to, but it's one of the most fundamental um, variables in determining the risk. So Mike, so Mike, so I, of course I can't help myself, so <laughs> I'm gonna inject here, but I, I'm 100% with you. We, you know, we talk a lot about leverage at Freedom Founders. Um, I'm a fan of leverage used the right way as I know you are as well and so I, th I think let's let's also just define leverage in terms of what that leverage looks like meaning uh, are we talking about a bridge loan as you mentioned earlier and so a short-term funding loan to get somebody through a, a project before they can get um, final long-term financing uh, is it is it short-term financing with uh, with a balloon or a call provision in three five or seven years uh, uh, is it variable interest rate um, I, I like leverage on long-term, uh, uh, I'll say a project, but a long-term project that, that doesn't, for me, doesn't have, need a lot of uh, development. You're going to talk a little bit about value add and what that means, and I, and I think that's an important distinction to bring out. So what does value add mean? So, so for me, today, using leverage, if I'm getting involved in a syndication, that is a, a, a single project that someone's putting together, it's self-storage or a multifamily or a mobile home park, and someone's going to do some value add. They're going to come in and uh, in, increase the, the occupancy by, 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 by fixing some of the infrastructure, or maybe they're going to add additional uh, units uh, so there's some land development. For me, Mike, the longer time duration as to where we are in the market right now, with shorter-term funding, 
that scares me a little bit. Now, if we can lock into long-term financing at today's good rates and have it, you know, fixed for at least 10 years in something, I and, and the cash flows there without having to do a lot of extra value, I'm, I'm okay. But it's the shorter term uh, lending that scares me a little bit more. Do you want to just add any context to that? Sure, David. Thank you for jumping in. Uh, again, I'm not against leverage on the country. I love leverage if you get great long-term rate fixed for 30 years or even seven years or five years. It's absolutely acceptable. Uh, but on a, on a fund level or on a deal level, it's very important to ask the question. So on our fund level, there is exactly zero leverage. So we don't leverage anything we have in the fund with debt. In other words, we could be making equity investments and then raising debt within the fund, creating leverage. So that's the one type of leverage I'm talking about. The second type of leverage, if we make loans, we can actually hypothecate pay, the, the, the paper. So the term hypothecation means we lend somebody money and we're holding a promissory note and we're borrowing against that note to get more liquidity to make more investments. We don't do that. So that's the kind of leverage I'm talking about. I'm talking about getting yourself a 10% yield and then hypothecating that with 6%. Right. Essentially, you're creating greater leverage while everybody's paying great. But when people stop paying, you have a problem on your hands. On a fund level, leverage could be absolutely acceptable. I've seen funds with 25 to 50% leverage and it's totally fine. But the issue becomes when the whole strategy is based on 75% leverage in everything. And then when music stops, and defaults increase and vacancy increases, the leverage sinks them, literally takes them down to the bottom very, very quickly. So that, that's what I'm talking about. Anyway, let me continue. So uh, downside protection is uh, investing in, for example, notes uh, or loans. It's a basically first trust deed secured by real estate at a reasonable loan to value ratio. I consider that sort of a safe type of investment. It's not guaranteed investment, but relatively safe. The good old days used to be 65%. Now it's got to 70 and 75%. That's all I'm saying. Uh, if you're an equity investor, I'm just back to your point. If you're an equity investor, I like investments with leverage, not 75%, but 65% and less. Why? Because as a equity investor, we I have a better cash flow relative to the debt service coverage ratio and the vacancy increases and there's other issues with the project that saves uh, the collapse of a project. It reduces the cash flow, but highly leveraged deals, when the vacancy increases, they, they sink first. So when you're looking at the syndication deals, uh, I prefer syndications with lower leverage. Lower means 65% versus 75%. That little bit of a leverage could make a big difference. That's all I'm saying. I'm not against, I'm, I'm, not, uh, <laughs> I'm not advocating no leverage. I'm just saying be very, very uh, cognizant of what leverage does. So let's so let's make sure people understand uh, you know loan to value. So let's say if, let's just use easy numbers. Let's say the the project uh, the the syndication in this case uh, is a ten million dollar. Uh, so you would say that the the max amount of leverage you'd like to see on that on that deal would be six point five million, correct? That's correct. Yeah, okay. six, six and a half million dollar loan and three and a half million dollar equity. Very good. That's healthy. Two to one leverage is healthy. Three to one is aggressive in my view. That's all I'm saying. And then debt service coverage ratio, it's just a simple mathematical number, uh, how much uh, net operating income you have uh, above expenses to, to cover debt service. So one and a half means for every dollar of a mortgage payment, you have dollar and a half worth of income. And that creates safety. Most banks require one and a quarter, but having one and a half is a, is a, is a good safe uh, number. Also, I like projects that uh, are income generating and then they are cash flow improving. So uh, cash flow is the king. If the project continues to improve cash flow, the chances are it can survive, it survive any kind of a down, uh, downturn. Versus, versus, a, versus um, an asset or project that is not in produce, producing today because uh, it's, it's, it's got a lot more work to put into, a lot more value add. Is that, is that what you're saying? Yeah, I'm saying actually both. Well, what helps is when it's a value add, uh, and there is some cash flow, at least a break even, and it improves over time. So yeah. that is acceptable. What is not acceptable is building in you know, a massive condo project, all speculative, all expecting you know, right. the price to stay where it is. That, those are drastic opposites, uh, but a value add with a break even cash flow today and all kinds of lease up uh, as units get renovated are totally fine. Those projects are not fundamentally not as, as risky as. as uh, as a high-end class, say, new apartment building, stuff like that. 
So Benjamin Graham. So again, if you're thinking about investing, just think about uh, safety of, of, of principle and a reasonable rate of return uh, versus everything else is speculation. There's a lot of speculation there. The reason I put this slide here is every time you see an investment opportunity, think a little bit about this. Is this an investment or speculation? Just philosophical. Question number two, what is annual return on investment? Now, uh, th this question, let me break it down to real basic principles and then we can talk about what kind of rates of investments are out there. So when you, whenever, you, whenever I think about a return, I always break it into two parts. Part number one is cash flow and part number two appreciation. It's as simple as that. So cash flow is what you get uh, today and appreciation is what you get tomorrow. Um, so it, when you're asking the question, what is the expected uh, annual return? Uh, you typically talking about on a fund level or on a project level uh, is a net annual return to investors. So th that's, th that is the projected return, what I'm talking about. Um, but when you are looking into a fund and the fund is live and it has a track record in the history, you absolutely should be asking uh, what, what are the trailing 12 numbers? So what were the distribution for the last 12 months? And what uh, was the total return for the last 12 months? And again, it's a combination of cash flow and appreciation. And then look at the last quarter. So th 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 those patterns are both true on individual deals and on a fund level. Always ask for the trailing 12 and always ask for the last quarter. It, it helps you understand the current picture. If they're consistent, great. If they're not consistent, then you can ask more questions. Uh, cash flow uh, and distributions. Uh, now, the, the, again, the cash flow is one of the two components of a total return. And it is very important to understand when you're getting cash flow, what is the percent of the total return comes in the form of a cash flow and what comes in the form of appreciation. So there are projects, I'll give you an example. If you invest in New York City when the cash flow is extremely weak, uh, bulk of the return comes as a result of the appreciation. If you invest in Midwest, the appreciation could be small component of the return while the cash flow is a large component of the return. I'm just trying to give you a little bit of a guidance. What I like to see is 50 to 75% of a return coming in form of cash, ongoing and improving, versus a lot of it coming on the back end as appreciation. Uh, and then appreciation comes in two forms, natural appreciation and a forced appreciation. Appreciation is simply uh, growth in the price uh, or, or value of an asset. And again, price and value can differ a little bit, but they move along approximately under the right market conditions together. And uh, natural appreciation is, is the tide that rises all boats. When things go up, that's what happens. The same thing happens in the reverse direction. The forced appreciation, it's a value that gets created through work. The value add could come in as a result of development, redevelopment, rehabilitation, uh, better management, uh, uh, some level of additional services on a property, cost reductions and so forth. Um, ultimately, the forced appreciation is far more valuable than, than the natural appreciation. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, what's gonna happen in, in the future. And, and if you think about this, so appreciation is what you get on the back end. So you got your cash flow over years and on the back end, the property is gonna get sold or refinanced. And um, when individual syndicated deals or even a fund, uh, they make assumptions of what they're gonna be able to sell the asset on the back end, simply because they finish the value add, they cash flow the property and there comes an exit point three years down the road, five years down the road. I see this is a very fundamental and very important point. There's a lot of uh, mistakes being made. It's not even mistakes. It's just people are using today's cap rates for the future sale price. And I, I can't stress this enough. This is an area of humongous risk. Numbers in the future will not be what they are uh, today as far as the cap rates are concerned. If you look at this little graph, uh, what it shows you, it shows you directionally what happens over time. Uh, as interest rates drop, and this would happen from uh, 2000 all the way till 2017, 
I, I don't remember exactly when the Fed reversed the, the direction, but the rates kept, generally speaking, going down, down, down. And what happened to cap rates? They kept going down, 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 down as well. And now, finally, Fed is raising rates, and the cap rates are not yet retreating. People are still paying top cap rates today. But what's going to happen? The, 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 the laws of gravity will reverse it. The reversal will happen. The cap rates will start going up because the interest rate's going up. There is a direct correlation. And my point is this, when you're looking at the projects and people are putting future cap rate at 6% as a likely sales price, well, it is extremely optimistic and the chances are it's not gonna happen. What will happen is the cap rates are going to get worse. And the Federal Reserve seems, seems to be on a mission to continue to keep raising interest rates. They announced, they just announced the one increase and they're planning to do, I think, at least three more increases. I don't know how, how bad they're gonna be, but my speculation is going to be that it's going to be you know, three quarters to 1% higher. Now, the cap rates can move, can change by almost a percentage points as a result of this. So this could happen a whole lot sooner than you think. Uh, now, the cap rates is what people are willing to pay for an asset. If it's a flood of money and continues to be very loose money, it is possible the cap rates will stay where they are now or not go up as badly. But there's a significant risk that they will go up. And I wanted to um, point this out to be because this will impact the appreciation that is getting promised on a lot of these projects. So if you're going in with cap rates low and the cap rates move up just a little bit, the exit price may not be what you expect. Sometimes you'll be happy to get out to break even. So, so, your, so your point here then, Mike, is, is to factor that in when you are looking at projected returns or projected returns that are given to you with assumptions that they're going to exit in three, four, or five years at a specific cap rate, if you and I, or anybody else who's astute, would look at that and make their own projection and say, well, if they can't exit at 6%, then I'm gonna make my projection at a different rate, and therefore, I'm gonna look at my re projected return as being different. And if I'm still good with that because of the cash flow of the project, then so be it, right? That's right, that's exactly what I'm saying. I'm saying rely on the cash flow and uh, don't rely as much on appreciation. That, that's, that, that's the key point. It's exactly, David, thank you for clarification. Mike, we had, we had one question, just uh, want to jump in. Uh, Dr. David Reisman asked uh, if you could just uh, re redefine real quickly uh, DSCR for him. Debt service coverage ratio. So again, it, it is a technical term, but in layman uh, uh, words, it just means that how much uh, cash flow you're getting after expenses, after paying your, your property taxes, after insurance, and, and uh, if there's any maintenance issues and so forth. How much, uh, if you take that amount of cash flow, let's just say you have $150, and then your debt service is $100. So the debt service ratio would be 1.5 by dividing your cash flow by the, the mortgage payments. Does that make sense? Yeah, it, it, what, what it means, Dave, and everybody else, is that it's, it, it's that ratio you know, greater than one, because one would be dead even, and you don't want a property where, where your cash flow just pays the mortgage, in, in, or it, after expenses, just pays the mortgage, there's no margin. So what Mike's saying, most banks look at a 1.25. Well, Mike's saying, let's, be, let's even add more margin, which I agree, go to 1.5, and now you've got uh, excessive cash flow, flow that can help deal with um, you know unknowns uh you know changes in the environment or just in the economy or whatever's going on so you've got more more room uh for your project to still manage that, that underlying debt service um, um andy andy baber asked uh can you expand a little bit more on the relationship between sales price and cap rates and that's that's a common question andy and i'm sure that others have so why don't you touch on that and maybe just uh, again maybe give an example in there mike so people can understand that relationship so uh, cap rate is essentially, uh, let's just say a given uh, real estate asset generates, uh, let's use $60,000 a year. Uh, after net operating income, after, after expenses, but before mortgage. So it generates $60,000 a year. And it sells, at, let's, it, let's call it 6% cap rate. It means that that asset is worth a million dollars. So you take you take $60,000, you divide by a million dollars, and you get 6%. So 6% cap rate simply means people are settling for cash on cash return. If there was no mortgage, and they get $60,000 a year from, from owning uh, a building, and th that building, they're willing to pay a million dollars for it. That, that's what the cap rate uh, is. So the sales price 
is a function of the cap rate, that the lower the cap rate, the higher the price. Now, if that same $60,000 uh, building, uh, if investors uh, were okay with 5% cap rate, then they would pay more for the building. It wouldn't be a million dollars at that point. It, it would be a million one hundred and twenty thousand. No. So uh, basically, you see the difference. One percent change in the cap rate going from six to five means that the price of the building increases by one hundred and twenty thousand dollar value. The reverse is true. When the cap rate goes to sell, and now imagine the building generates the same sixty thousand dollars a year, and now the market cap rates are seven. It's no longer going to generate sales price of a million dollars. It's probably be, uh, I don't have a calculator, but it's going to be approximately, you know, less, say 800, and, you yeah. know, some 880,000, maybe a little bit, a little bit less actually. So, so yeah, so, so my, so my. Humongous impact, humongous. Yeah, yeah. So, so we know one of the things that will, will is going to affect the cap rates, which you just brought up, uh, is, is rising interest rates. You know, you just already mentioned since 2017, the Fed started uh, raising them. They, they still seem like they're going to keep, keep them raising a quarter of a point uh, at a time. Uh, so that's one thing that's going to affect cap rates. Uh, what, it, what else could affect cap rates? Uh, dumb and dumber money. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, which is plenty, plenty of that out there today. Yeah, there's, there's just a, a lot of people chasing deals. So all the amateurs, everybody else now, you got to be really worried because, you know, all these gurus have trained all these specialists now. They've taken multifamily and self-storage and whatnot training courses, and they're all running around trying to deploy their money and borrowing from their mom and pop and friends and family. So they're overpaying for assets. On top of that, there is still foreign capital inflowing. If there is instability in other parts of the world, then my money still moves here. When it moves here, it needs a place to go. So it's the inflow, uh, global inflows of capital. It's um, obviously interest rates. What's happening with interest rates is really simple. So if you can get 6% cap rate while owning a building, and ultimately you can get the same money by keeping your money in the bank. If Fed raises rates and the banks pay more in demand deposits, people don't want to take risk. That's why um, rising interest rates, they sort of compete with all these uh, income generating real estate assets. And uh, as rates go up, the substitution effect takes place and people are not willing to give their money with the same lower level of rates of return. It's that simple. It's basic yeah. economics. Well said. Uh, I'll just make a comment that um, in the Alternative 101 uh, training modules that you all have access to, uh, I went into some detail on, on cap rates and a lot of the terminology Mike's using. To, so if it still doesn't make sense, uh, go in and find that module and uh, just go through it again and we'll help explain some of that. So, all right, Mike, let's, let's, let's roll. So it's not exact formula, but there is correlation. So yeah. the, the rule of thumb is that as the interest rates go up, cap rates will go up with them. Let's continue. Question number three, uh, fund income and, and taxation. So you should understand if, if, it's, a, if it's a fund or a syndication, uh, what kind of asset it is or assets that are in the fund and what kind of income it generates. Typically, uh, in a fund like ours, we generate some interest income and we generate cash flow from equity ownership. But we do pass through depreciation deduction. So depending on type of asset, you may have standard depreciation or you may have also accelerated depreciation. Very important uh, if you are using non-qualified money. If you're using qualified money, it doesn't really make a difference. Depreciation deduction is not, not useful for IRAs and 401ks, but it is something uh, that you should keep in mind if you're investing in taxable dollars. And also, depending on the uh, fund strategy or depending type of assets, uh, on, on exit of an asset, there might be capital gains generated, which are taxed better than the uh, normal rates. So keeping that in mind. Also, please keep in mind, this is an extremely important point, that distributions may or may not equal to the income generated for tax purposes. It happens all the time. So the good news is most of the time, because of the depreciation, your distributions are higher than your tax liabilities. So and if you invest in a fund, then you get 100,000 distribution, and then of the year, it only shows that you have 80,000 taxable. That's a good news, that 20,000 got written off because of depreciation. Just giving you a general idea how it works. Uh, one thing that you should absolutely uh, be aware, and, and I've seen this issue a number of times. So when you invest your IRA money into a fund, the fund has no fund leverage, we don't create risk of UBIT. But when you invest your capital directly into a deal with leverage, and again, IRA funds, not self-directed 401k, it's a difference. Yep. But when you invest 
uh, self-directed IRA into a syndication, and syndication has leverage, it will most likely cause UDFI tax. UDF, it's a little bit technical. I apologize for the complication. But it, all it stands for is uh, uh, unrelated debt finance income uh, taxes due. It's another form of UBIT. So just be aware that uh, you know, 401ks are totally fine, but self-directed IRAs and s s syndicated equity investments, they don't, you know, you could still do the investment, but you, you could, could generate the tax. Just be aware of that. Yeah, so, so let me say that, um, again, we, we don't have time to go deep into that topic, but it's a topic that if you are using qualified or self-directed uh, retirement plans other than uh, solo 401k, that, that what Mike's saying is absolutely true. Um, now, UBIT is not a deal killer. Let me say that. It's not a deal killer uh, at all. In fact, uh, there's, there's a lot of times the, the returns are, you know, makes a lot of sense to, to still utilize that. But if you want more information about uh, UBIT or UDFI, which is essentially the same thing, uh, Quest IRA has uh, some really great uh, webinars and, and, and topics on that. Just go to their, their, uh, their website and just download and just type in uh, UBIT. Uh, and they'll give you some information on that, and you can uh, you know look at that a little bit more. If it's outside your qualified retirement plan, then then none of that applies. In fact, you get a, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, a lot of those benefits that Mike outlined. One last thing about um, UBIT is that Mike actually uh, depreciation uh, can help offset some of that UBIT uh, inside the qualified uh, plan. So that could be a help. Um, and John Gillespie just asked me a question, so let me grab it real quick. So I come in. Uh, so John says, do we know which of the funds Freedom Founder members have access to that are subject to, to UBIT? Um, well, Mike, you just you just uh, talked about the fact because you don't use leverage in your funds, your funds are not subject to UBIT. Right. Uh, uh, John, I'd, I'd have, we'd, you'd have to go back and uh, uh, to each of the fund sponsors uh, and ask. Um, and typically, Mike, um, tell me if I'm wrong, but don't the K-1s uh, that come out from uh, – Show, show that or should they not show that to the to the individual investor well the k1 i asked the question to, to kingsley and i specifically uh, uh checked on this and, and kingsley reconfirmed that they they do uh, they do mark them off as a qualified retirement account uh and uh the, the k1s um uh it's a it's a technical issue but from what i've seen that they are specifically marked as 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 uh, there is no there's no checkbox that says no UBIT on a K-1, but the K-1 will show it's an IRA account and no taxes due. But that's, that's what I remember from the last, uh, from what King, King, Kingsley told me. So, so John and others that are asking about that question, uh, I would just go directly to the fund sponsor, uh, the trust advisor who is running the fund and just ask them uh, if, if their fund is subject to UBIT. Uh, and then you can take it from there. So that's, that's the easiest answer. Then try to remember who all is investing in, what, in which funds, okay? Good question. All right, let me continue. So number <clears throat> number four, probably one of the most important questions is liquidity. Like like anything else, uh, businesses or deals um, uh, have problems when they have problems with liquidity. So w when you are looking to invest into anything, and I've seen funds with terrible liquidity and their funds with great liquidity, and the same thing happens with uh, with deals. You know, can invest a deal that has a very little liquidity, it's a syndication that acquires a bunch of assets and, and uh, holds them and there's no liquidity at all to redeem. So it's very important to know uh, what is the liquidity of a given investment. So it, liquidity comes typically from three sources. Number one, it comes from investment income. Uh, so on a fund level, we have a bunch of investments that generate income, that's number one. Number two, we get uh, repayments of the capital. So we make a hard money loan and the loan is repaid, which happens sufficiently often because we are a uh, hard money fund partially. Uh, we get liquidity back heavily from the coming back files and we redeploy it again. The third level of liquidity is a net capital raise. Um, if a fund is able to raise more capital than redemptions, it, it's, it's net positive. If the fund has a lot of redemptions, it's net negative. But there are three essentially sources of liquidity. And uh, one of the key questions to ask to understand funds liquidity is how much money does fund have in cash in short-term investments? So for us, we have a lot of short-term investments. We have roughly 60% today in hard money loans, which are short-term investments. Uh, there are uh, funds uh, and uh, individual deals that have very little in cash and very little in short-term. Everything is deployed 
on long-term multi-year holding uh, projects. So when you invest in those, you have very little liquidity and very little ability to redeem. You have to read a private place memorandum. Say, I've seen those that says uh, redemption within the first seven years is subject to manager's approval. Boom. <laughs> you have you put your money in, you can't get your money out. You'll get the income that the, that the asset generates, but you're stuck. So uh, this is something very, very important if you're looking to be able to get uh, some of your money back or all your money back, liquidity of a given fund or liquidity of a given project is critically important. Does this make sense? Yeah, I was typing an answer to a question, but uh, I think it does. Well, I'll look for more questions uh, if they come in. Yeah, I'll continue. But uh, of all things, I, I'm just, just saying liquidity is something you absolutely have to think about in every investment. Is the investment liquid enough? Okay. And it depends on the owner given fund. And, 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 and so, 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 so someone from the outside um, in, in looking at a particular fund, fund then how, how can they best assess that? How can they best assess fund liquidity, Mike? So the two questions that I mentioned, how, how much of funds liquidity is in cash or short-term investments, really important. Again, short-term investments typically define in traditional sense under one year, expected to come back within one year. Most of our, our paper expected to come back within six months. The other question is how much capital you're raising relative to the uh, total fund capital. So we raise a good amount of capital. I, I'll give you an example. Uh, last quarter, we raised about a million and a quarter. Some quarters we raised two million and we are 10, 11 million dollar fund. So we're raising easily 10, sometimes 20% of a fund of new capital because we are a growing fund. For us, liquidity is easy. Somebody wants to redeem, it, it, it's, it's a sneeze today. When we, when we get much bigger, much more mature, it may be a, a little bit less of, uh, uh, of you know, we, we, we won't have a, as great liquidity. But again, if we continue to do hard money loans, we'll, we'll still maintain decent level of liquidity. Does that make sense? Yeah, so, so hard money loans, obviously short term, uh, and then uh, cash. So between the two, um, if you're doing, for, between the two, then what's what percentage, percentage of liquidity, if, if you include hard money loans as, cash equivalent, which it's pretty close to it. Yeah, you can sell the paper too. If yeah, you sell the paper. So, yeah, so, 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 so what do you like in a growing fund, a total percentage of cash or cash equivalent uh, percentage-wise? So 20%, 10, 15, 20%? We have 60 because of the nature of the fund. Because you we got 60. 60. 60. 60. Zero. Yeah. Zero. We are very, 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 very high. Very, because yeah, that's, really that's very liquid. So what would you consider marginally liquid then? So it depends on what, what folks invest into. If mm -hmm. they invest only in long-term, uh, let's just say building holding or multifamily holdings or self-storage holdings, I mean, 10 to 20% is, is the healthy number. 10 to 20% and enables them to, to maintain redemptions and so forth. Below 5% is bad. And uh, so that the, the 5 to 10% is normal liquidity depending on the strategy. So it's really a function of uh, maturity of the fund and type of assets. And 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 and, and which documents uh, will that will the will that be uh, disclosed? Or you know how, how do you how do you disclose what 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 your goal is? And and what and what if you what if you don't meet that goal? What if what if your documents, Mike, yours or someone else's, say that your intention is to maintain a fifty or sixty percent um, liquidity in, in cash or cash equivalents, and and then you decide to change horses and you decide to, to, to keep much less uh, and that affects, you know, the, the entire subscription. How, how, does that, how does that work? So we, we don't have this defined anywhere. The, 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 what's interesting is most fund PPMs don't have specific uh, liquidity requirements. There is no liquidity requirement, formal liquidity requirement. What is there is that there might be maximum leverage allowed equity to debt on a fund level. There might be some other things that our private placement memorandum would uh, specify. The, the liquidity is not necessarily specified, at least um, not in our offering documents. We are fairly liquid, but this is a question that folks should ask, regardless you know, what percentage of the fund, this is a very easy question. What percentage is short term and cash relative to your total portfolio? It's just, a, it's a way to educate yourself before you make the investment, understanding how a given fund uh, uses cash. Because it's different and, and it's not one question, it's a combination of a few questions. Um, what the fund invests into. And, and, and the other really important question is, are you still raising capital? If a fund stops raising capital, the liquidity may be pretty bad at that point. So you, 
I wish there was a simple answer. It's a combination of those answers that, 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 that paint the picture, not necessarily a single answer. Yeah, okay, very good, thank you. Sure, all right, let me continue. Um, question number fun, what are the fun fees? And are they fair? <laughs> the reason I'm, I'm, I'm saying this because I've seen so much here, now we're gonna get into some really interesting uh, points and I wanna make sure we, we still have a, lot of, a good amount of time. So uh, why it's important to know how a fund manager uh, makes a living? Well, the reason it's important is because it's impacting your investment. If the motivation for fund manager is different that, that, than yours, then they'll be milking you with fees and your returns will be uh, subdued. So here's an example. Typically, the fund manager makes money by uh, having management fees. So standard annual management fees could be 1%, 2%. The range is between 1% and 2%. There is no standard. It depends on the fund. The, the, the next uh, uh, level of uh, fees are the performance fees. I believe those are the most important fees because they drive the fund manager to generate better performance. So typically, a fund, or not every fund, but many funds have a preferred return called also PREF. So performance fees is what the fund manager receives when they are able to receive a PREF. So in the, in the example here is if, if the fund pays investors 7% preferred return uh, and it generates income to investors, distributable cash or distributable income above 7%, then there are performance fees. And normally uh, they're in the range and I gave you the range, sometimes they even you know, beyond this range, but it, it, within our fund, and I'll, you'll see that in a second, you can get 60 to 80% of the upside above 7%. Yeah, and, and you've got it down below, but, but the 60 or 80 is, is in favor of the investor, not the yes, manager. the investor. We have it in the presentation. I'll, I'll stress this out, that these are very important ratios. Let, let me keep rolling forward and I'll show you some examples. of all. And, 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 and 7% preferred or pref means that that's first money out. So as an investor, right. I, you know, I, before anybody gets any other splits or anything else, I, I'm going to know I'm going to get 7%. And then the back end would be the, the performance fees. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Thank you, David, for clarification. The other uh, thing you got to watch out for is asset level fee and origination fees. So in a minute, well, in the next slide, you will see how much difference they make. So th there are funds that charge, the fund manager charges the fund asset origination fee just to buy an asset into the fund. They charge the fees. And you got to be aware because it milks the 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 income away from the fund. It milks it, it dilutes the assets of the fund, transfers them to, to the manager. Now, Mike, that's that's different than if someone was a actual broker or was participating in the transaction and getting a, a, a brokerage fee, correct? Out, outside versus that's correct. Yeah, yeah, of course, it, it is. It is. It, it's a, it's a fund manager charging sort of brokerage fee to the fund for putting the money in the deal. But no, but normal, normally brokerage fees. Um, are, are, are part part of a sales sales arrangement. So uh, again, are you saying that they're they're kind of equivalent? No matter how the the manager gets a a, a an asset, it, 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 it depends. Some funds allow for for fees, and some mm -hmm. funds charge significant fees. Uh, I'm just trying to show this as an example okay. in uh, funds and also syndication that charge uh, acquisition fee, and sometimes it's a significant fee. I've seen syndications that charge four percent. Uh, acquisition fee, very significant fees. All it means is investors have to fund that money and that money goes not into the deal, but straight to the, to the fund sponsor. So anyway, um, the other important element is the fairness element in, in how much does investor make relative to what investors, how much does a manager make uh, or, or project sponsor make relative to the investors make. In my view, it is a very simple picture. picture. Uh, let's, just, let's just say that the investors um, uh, that the investors make 12% and a manager makes 4% total. That ratio is absolutely reasonable. In other words, three quarters of the income goes to the investors and one quarter goes to the manager for man fi finding the opportunity, running the deal and so forth. That ratio is fair. The issue becomes when it's disbalanced. So fair ratio is anywhere between 60-40 and 80-20. There is no specific number. Uh, there is no golden rule. Uh, there's a, uh, but you know, roughly 75-25 is a reasonable uh, ratio. You gotta watch out when the fund manager starts making more than investors make. That's, that's the case where I believe it's not fair. Let, let, me, let me put it this way. Um, so the other important uh, question is, uh, is the manager motivated to do deals 
or to make better returns. So low or no asset level a manager only fees is what makes a difference. Now I'm not saying is anything wrong with manager charging some fees. I'm just saying low fees are reasonable when it's all to the manager and nothing to the investors. That's not right. Let me give you some examples. This is how we we have things structured with Temp Opportunity Fund. So we uh, project the target return to investors 10 to 13 percent, the preferred return, and the other very important element here is the word is accumulative or not. Within our fund, it's a cumulative return. There are many syndication deals that I've seen that don't have cumulative preferred return. Why it's important? Well, because if it's underpaid, uh, cumulative means it's gotta be caught up. If it's non-cumulative, it never gets uh, caught up. This is a critical difference, especially if a given project does not have good cash flow year one. So I wanted uh, to, to, to stress this out. Uh, PREF should be cumulative uh, in order to be good. So, 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 so to say that in a different way, if I invest my money in uh, to today, but there's no cash flow to make distributions for maybe six months or a year, what you're saying with cumulative, I'm going to still get my return from day one paid to me when those distributions are available from the cash flow. If it's non-cumulative, that means uh, the money I put in today is not um, accruing any return to it, and, and, and it starts accruing it only when the, the project can start paying, paying distributions. Is that correct? Exactly. Okay. It's exactly correct. So very, very important. So, so again, is this, a, is this a question that someone should ask straight up? Is this a question that's going to be in the documents? How does somebody know? So you have to read the cumulative PREF. It will typically say cumulative non-compounded PREF. That's the, wor that's the wor wording. It will say okay. cumulative non-compounded PREF. If it doesn't say, it often masks the fact that it's not cumulative. I've seen those deals. So all I'm gonna say is this, if it doesn't say cumulative, it's probably not. Uh, now, you, you, you can ask, you can ask, uh, is the PREF cumulative? And they're gonna tell you yes or no. It's a, it's a very simple answer. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, the other thing is the performance splits. Here's, I'm giving you an example of what we have in our fund. Investors always get more than a manager above 7% PREF. We do get 2% management fee to keep the lights on. But in general, in general, if you follow most of the ratios, if you, know, if you use a, an average um, uh, B units, we get paid roughly 30 cents of every dollar and the investors get 70 cents above every dollar. That is a fair and reasonable ratio. People put in a million dollars and they get 80 cents uh, and we get 20 cents. Now, the big difference, again, I'm not trying to promote a fund, but, but, but our fund happened to be structured in a very investor-friendly manner. So within our funds, all the points we collect on every single deal, all the fees, they flow to the fund, not the manager. We get paid a portion of that, but following the waterfall, which we mean 7% PREF, and then we split. So investors, essentially, minimum they're gonna get is 60% of the points. Right. Right, so. As opposed to some, as you said, some 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 funds, uh, the, the managers keep all the points. All the points, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, so. And the other thing I want to bring out with A, B, and C units, uh, one of the cool things about having financial friends or being part of a group like Freedom Founders uh, is that, uh, and this is this has been done within our group, is uh, let's say uh, you want to want an A unit, but you don't you don't have or you don't want to put a million dollars into one fund you want to diversify. Well, you might want to do a hundred thousand, maybe you get ten buddies, right, to go there and form uh, their own LLC that can then uh, you know go into your fund that way and make, and then all those people that are part of that financial friends network can, can be part of a, an A unit uh, return, correct? That's correct, exactly correct. And then the, the other thing that I wanted to say, when we are invest into anything, we don't charge anything to the fund on the origination level. I'm just, I'm just clarifying this. Now, let me go to the next slide and you're gonna see some, some more music. You're gonna see some good, the bad, and the ugly. All right. Okay, so here's an example of a good syndication deal. And, and I've seen them and I wanted to, to, to say, these are good deals. And at times we will invest in a deal like this. This is, this is based on a model of some of the deals we've invested into uh, on a fund level. With the right sponsors, these type of deals are solid. So the target total return, uh, 16 to 18% net to investors on average per year, also known as IRRs, internal rate of return. We have many deals well above 20%, but I wanted to give you a reasonable deal, nothing totally crazy, okay? This is a very reasonable deal. We have plenty of them in the fund, and these are solid deals, where you actually have total return to be in around 16 to 18% per year on a fund level, of which 8% is, is, comes from a PREF and is cumulative. 
there is management fee to the project sponsor of 1%. That is reasonable. That is not crazy. Right. Is a performance split uh, above the 8%, typically 70-30. Again, that's reasonable. It's right down the middle of a reasonable split. This is not crazy. Distribution of the quarterly uh, origination fees to the manager, I've seen 1%. That is reasonable. They found the deal that's working well, mm -hmm. but it's not excessive. And then, then you look at the cash flows. And then the projected cash flows will generate year one, 10 to 11, year two is slightly improving, and then year three is slightly improving. And as you can see, bulk of the return is coming here as a cash flow instead of coming as appreciation. So you're getting more than 50% uh, as a cash flow, 10 to, you know, let's just say 10 to 13% per year will come in cash flow, and then the rest will come on the back end with the assumption of some level of appreciation of so value. So even if everything, uh, all the projections fell apart and in year five on the exit, uh, cap rates, uh, you know, are, are, are where the, the, the exit doesn't allow for as big a projected return. Since, since over 50% of the return is based on cash flow, you, you really can't do about worse than that, uh, even though the projection target return is 60 18. I mean, worst, worst, worst case, you're, you're going to have your, your cash flow. Exactly. Dave. It's, it's exactly, this is the beauty about this deal. That's why we like them. Yep. The reason we like them because even the cash, the cash flow is the cash in the pocket. That is the money made. The rest is all speculative. Exactly. Good. Here's a bad deal. A really bad deal. I've seen them. And <laughs> what's amazing, <laughs> both you and I know some really good people who better do get, this. That are setting these, these deals up right now. Yeah, I, I, I agree. This is, this is not good at all. Go ahead and describe it. Okay. So uh, what they do is they'll say 12% uh, target rate of return to investors. Um, and then there's a preferred return. And, some, and it's non-cumulative. Sometimes it's cumulative, sometimes it's non-cumulative. But the point is, there's a PREF that's non-cumulative. There are, uh, I've seen the deals, literally it was a deal over the weekend that came in. <laughs> the fees were written, it wasn't 1% or 2% per year. They were written to completely at discretion of the manager. Oh my gosh. It was so crazy. It's like they can go pay themselves whatever they want. Uh, the performance split above the PREF, I've seen they do 50-50, which is kind of as light as it goes, mm -hmm. but then they cap it. They it's say, 12, yeah. well, that's it. Everything else, it's not yours to keep. Yeah. That's a problem. Uh, I've seen deals coming from some really sharp people. It's not 70-30, it's 30-70. Investors put up 100% of the capital, and then they get 30% of the upside. So watch out for this. Uh, you, you, this information needs to be well understood. Typically, typically is described in a term sheet and obviously offering documents, a private placement memorandum. But please pay attention. 70, 30, 30, 70 sounds like you're getting 70. No, the sponsor is getting 70, you're getting 30. Pay attention. I've seen deals that have no distribution. So you think it says, you know, there's a PREF and it's cumulative, but there are no distribution. Now, at times it's totally legit, totally legit. I'll give you a live example. Well, I literally, I wired the money today in the deal in New York City. We bought a piece of a non-performing note. Right. Right? So I think, David, I told you about the, the note in the past. It's got 24% right. default rate. So if the deal goes uh, bad, we have to foreclose. And we get the building, we'll probably get over 24%. And if, it, if, it, if the borrower pays off, we'll get 24% minus sponsor carry of about 4%. We'll get 20% to the fund. But the point is, if it's a... Full foreclosure, there's no liquidity. Right. So putting a little bit of money in a deal like that is fine. But that deal has massive downside protection because we're picking up something that's worth over eight million for five and a half. And and just and just to play off on that, there's uh there's about six or seven people in the elite group that uh, and I'm part of that. We're we're doing a uh, like a mini syndication into that kind of a an asset class, non performing. And so so we've already put in the term sheet, uh, no distributions expected. Uh, during the until the maturity date because of that very fact. So thanks for bringing that up. Sure, there's nothing wrong with this. Just be aware, some deals will not have that. Yep. Well, I've seen fund manager fees four percent. I mean, it's, uh, the origination fee is a little ridiculous. Four percent to finding an asset. I mean, you're going to get all the upside on the performance. So charge one percent, not four. And the cash flows are low. So so pay attention. Let me keep running forward. So this is an example of that. Uh, so another really really important. Uh, I just want to stress this for people. A good looking deal can go bad. It happens. So just be, um, I'm not scaring anybody, but I'm, I'm, I'm just saying you have to be prepared that it can happen. It can happen for the following reasons, just for educational purposes. Could be fraud. The fraudsters paint 
phenomenally good picture. They're really good at this. They're gonna they're gonna paint you a picture like you won't believe. It. Uh, <clears throat> you can also have lack of integrity. So sponsors will literally milk the. They have ways to milk the project. Uh, they will mismanage deals. You can have really bad contractors. Uh, you can have market conditions. It has happened. We, we, we can have another crash. You can have unexpected competition. You're building a self-storage facility and five more popped up right around the corner. I don't know why, but it can happen. Um, and projections can vary from reality. So they projected X numbers and the Y numbers showed up. And again, be very careful when you hear guaranteed secure returns. <laughs> These words should sound Red alert, red alert, there's a possibility of a fraud. Well, Mike, can they, can they, can they even legitimately use the, that language in a PPM? I, I, I don't know. I, I can tell you I, it, 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 it is possible that they'll say guaranteed, but guaranteed by who? Yeah. And they say, we'll guarantee you 8% return. I've, I've seen people say, who is going to guarantee when this thing is not performing? Are you personally guaranteeing this? Is the federal government guaranteeing this? Is there some kind of a, a insurance corporation is guaranteeing this? It's it's all you know. It's, it's it's all marketing mumbo jumbo. Let me put it this way. All right, let me keep running forward. Next question: Frequency of distribution. This is self-intuitive, real simple. Um, you should always ask the question: Can you invest distributions? Um, again, most funds allow this. Deals cannot. What are you going to do with reinvested distributions? You got the money as a cash flow. You can't reinvest. Just be aware. Um, also ask for his last 12 months and last quarter history of distribution. And again, what percent, what percent uh, distributions represent of a total return? Let me keep running forward. Seven, what is the fund management experience? Track record, how many years they've been in the industry? How many years have been at this fund? Uh, how many years they've been in other funds? If it's syndicated project, how many syndicated projects like this have you done over the last five years? Again, track record, last 12 months, last three to five years. Question number eight, uh, type of quality of deal flow. How does the manager get, get deal, real deals? Really important. You can ask the question, well, I advertise. You know, we know what kind of deals you're getting if you're advertising. So it's really important to understand, uh, is it marketing driven or is it relationship network driven? Best deals are coming from uh, non-advertised stuff. Correct. Yeah, what type of deals? Um, so this is really important. That equity as a type, uh, deal size, location, value add, or performing. Again, just understanding. And how good these deals? What is the risk to what ratio? What's the target return on investments? And what's the downside protection? Again, I'm running through this quickly, so I want to get through the content. Question number nine, what is the fund strategy? Now, this is a broad question. We can have another little conversation on this, but I wanted to at least mention. Uh, diversification has got to be a critical part of the fund strategy. Diversification should be between a uh, number of assets, type of location, borrower sponsors, debt or equity deals, type of deals, multifamily, self-storage, whatnot, investment size. Now, diversification can be both beauty and a curse. Uh, there are plenty of people who have a niche and they run that business extremely well, and that can be a very good fun too. So I'm not saying diversification is a requirement to success, but it certainly mitigates risk. Now, asset types, as I mentioned, there's all kinds of asset types. Um, now, niches, that I've seen, David, we both know really good niches. So Wendy and Bill run a phenomenal niche. They run North and South Carolina hard money. That's all they do. And they're very good at this, right? So niche could be a phenomenal uh, opportunity. There are self-storage specialists. We know those. There are multifamily specialists. There are people who do mobile parks. There are people who do uh, tax deeds or, or, or tax certificates. There are people who do non-performing notes. Eddie, I mean, Ryan, they, they do phenomenal work. That's their specialty. So, uh, but I wanted to mention all those things. Uh, also, it's really important to understand what is funds focus. So when you're investing in a fund, uh, you should think about, is it a growth fund? Is it an income fund or growth and income fund? Or better put income in growth fund. Or better yet, income growing fund. So <laughs> right. what I'm saying is uh, absolutely be aware of what you're investing yourself into. Uh, risk profile, very important. Um, uh, does the fund have a lot of risky, risky type assets with high leverage and limited diversification or the reverse is true? Again, these are strategy, fund strategy questions. Question number 10, open-ended versus closed-ended funds. Uh, so very simple distinction. Uh, typically, closed-ended funds raise money for a certain period of time, and then they stop. And then they put the money to work, acquire assets. They hold the assets through the life cycle, could be valued or not. 
and then they make periodic distributions or not, and then they return, they exit assets and then they return capital. That's open, that's a closed ended fund. The open ended funds, like ours, we typically raise money on going basis. We don't stop. Uh, we do have a hundred million limitation, but until that limit is reached, we, we continuously raising money. Subscription and redemption happen periodic basis uh, at the um, at the NAV, net asset value price, and that happens within our fund quarterly. Some funds can do this monthly. Some ones can do it uh, at different frequencies. Uh, the open ended funds like ours typically we mark the market. That that's the net asset value every quarter is computed, and we have to make assumptions about the value of the assets up and down. Uh, sometimes we don't do anything. Sometimes we mark them up if they are uh, going up through their life cycle, value at life cycle, and sometimes we mark them down if they are distressed. And they, uh, the the funds acquire and dispose of assets. Typically, open-ended funds distribute all the distributable income. So what so we do on a quarterly basis, and they hold investments. Uh, indefinitely there's no exit strategy so a closed-ended fund could have a strategy 10 years open-ended fund could have there's no specific exit we buy assets like warren buffett buys i want to hold them forever per se let me continue so some advanced questions really important advanced questions now these questions you will not find them necessarily in opening uh, in offering documents these are the questions you can ask fund manager to understand how they run their fund uh same thing with syndicators you can ask them for the, these type of questions so when uh, you approach a fund manager, you can ask them, would you be open to show me the portfolio of assets? What do you have in the fund? What type of assets? We run them with full transparency. Uh, some fund managers, especially the question would be, if I become an investor, do you show what's in the, what's in the fund to in existing investors in the fund? We don't show it necessarily to new people, but to existing investors, we show on quarterly basis. Uh, frequency of communication. Uh, how often do you communicate with investors and what do you communicate? Do you do quarterly updates? Do you do quarterly presentations, quarterly calls, ad hoc updates? Again, these are examples of good communications. It doesn't mean uh, it, it, it's, it's a perfect world, but we're not hiding any rabbits in the closet. So, or skeletons in the closet, I'm sorry. Uh, Co-investment opportunities. I've been asked about that a number of times and I, I continue to maintain philosophy. If we find a good deal and the fund is limited to 500,000 investment per asset and the investment need, needs a million dollars, I would be delighted to have co-investors uh, that are already in the fund just to take a piece of the deal because we underwrote the deal. So I believe it's a good sign when, you, when a fund uh, opens co-investment opportunities when they exist. So deal selection, these are some of the questions that you can ask fund managers. Um, typically, what percent of the, of the received deals gets underwritten uh, and reviewed? Uh, there's no magic number. It's just, you know, it depends on where you get the deals. So if you get your deals from the street, you should have pretty low ratio, right. a lot of the garbage out there. If you're getting the deals from good people, you still should be turning down a good number. I mean, literally I'm getting deals from some people, good deals. But we ranked all our relationships in the one to five. So if I'm getting a deal from a five, who is the best, that deal has a much better preference than getting it from a three. I literally got a deal from a guy who is a three. He's not bad, but he's not great. And I'm going to look at those deals. But in order for me to really get con con convinced to do the deal, I have to really like the deal. So the point is, uh, the number of deals that, that get funded or get, get reviewed is a small percentage. So there's no magic number, but I'm just telling you, if you ask a fund manager what percentage of the deals you fund that, that come across your desk and they tell you 90%, that's your answer, something's wrong. Um, and then general underwriting and selection criteria. Our next one is gonna be an example of a syndication underwriting and, and review consideration. I'm gonna run through this very quickly. There's a lot of information here. It's not a perfect list, but I'm just giving you a sort of a framework of what you need to look at when you're looking at a deal uh, or a fund. But this specifically is for a deal. So number one, we start with a project sponsor. Why it's important? Because we start with a person. I don't care how good the deal is. If, I, if we didn't get referral to the sponsor or it's not one of ours who came on a referral, it's highly, highly unlikely we'll even look at the deal. And, and to be clear, Mike, the sponsor is the operator, the one who's going to yes. be running. Yes, okay. The sponsor is the operator who is going to be running the deal through yep. whatever life cycle they're going to be running the deal. If I don't know the person and they don't come highly referred to us, I am a fearful of putting the money with an idiot, okay, or, or a crook. So 
project sponsor, you got to check the integrity. Really important. Do they do what they say they do? What's the experience? How many projects like this have they done? What's their track record? If they can show you track record of previous projects, that's great. Now, I know some of it is their own marketing, but at least ask the question. If you can get this an answer, great. So again, vetting a sponsor is number one. Then number two is vetting the asset. Again, these are not, there are many other questions, but I'm just giving you some framework. So assets, what, why is this a good deal? So the first question I ask, why do you think it's a good deal? Why are you bringing me the deal? And they're gonna tell you their story. And if the story makes sense, that's a great start. They're gonna tell you, well, I got this deal because somebody passed away and then the widow doesn't want to manage this property, that's a good start, right? So the, these type of conversations, and then what's the value add plan? So again, I'm gonna give you examples. Value add plan, I literally have a deal and we're gonna probably take down with a fund with another CG person, self-storage. It's a great existing self-storage facility with the 8% cap rate going in, rates about 20% below the market, full occupancy, and, it's, and then the area is under supply. They can bump up the rates 10 to 20% and cut expenses 5% very quickly. And then there's a lot of land next to it. So the value at plan you need to understand is expansion or renovation. In this case, land supports a, a lot of additional self-storage units and can be built in a couple of phases. So value at plan is very important. Uh, management through the value add. Who's going to manage the, the value add? Somebody comes to you and then you, you know, you, you, you've got to pay... No, have they done projects like this? How many? Is, is somebody helping them who knows how to do this stuff? And the person who brought us the deal has a partner who's going to go in the deal who has like seven self-storage facilities. So having that really helps. Risks. Now, you got to understand the risks. Obviously, we look at the environmental. So one of the questions they ask, uh, he's working with a bank. He says, has the bank asked for environmental studies? Is are they going to test the land? So environmental risks, you have competition risk, you have market condition risk. Then you got to look at the appraisal, if it's you know, self-storage, for example, feasibility study, competitive market analysis, comps, environmental tests, and so forth. So the, again, you underwrite the asset. Then the third element of that is, is review the structure and the project financial. You can have a great deal that has terrible terms to investors. Okay, so all the, the, the one could be great, the two could be great. Again, project sponsor is great, asset is phenomenal, but the terms offered to investors stink. I've seen plenty of those. Again, with all due respect to great sponsors. Um, so uh, we look at the basics. So equity capital needed and, and debt capital needed, total capital stack. How much money they need, how much of it is debt, how much of it is equity. We look at the current financial and future projections. That like this, this self-storage deal, I spent a couple of hours looking at the current numbers and what can be done to improve. So your current uh, numbers plus uh, future projections and you can model it up and down. You could say, what if the income, you're basically doing a little stress test. What if this drops, what if this goes up and you play around with numbers and if the numbers make sense, could be a great deal. Again, current, current and, and future projections. Then you look at the preferred return and the performance splits. We talked a little bit about this. If the deal is structured with pretty poor non-cumulative non craft uh, or the performance splits are not right, those things can kill the deal right there. Uh, look at the cash flow. Cash is the king. What is going to be the cash flow for year one, two, three, four, five? I often see wonderful IRR, and you look at the cash flow, it's terrible. And then where's the cash? This stuff has to add up. So very, very important. The IRR calculations make sense. I looked at the, at the deals that had IRR 25%, and you go through the cash flow calculation, and then you add cash flow plus appreciation, and they don't, they don't add up to 25%. So you got to dig through the math. The bottom line is if they're projecting 25% a year, it's gotta come from two sources. It's the cash and the appreciation. If those things don't add up, how do they come up with 25%? I don't know. Um, uh, fees and alignment of interest. Again, deals that have heavy fees don't align with interest of, of investors. They, they, they basically motivate the, the, the sponsor to charge the fees and, and not to get great returns. Let's continue. Uh, should you invest in individual deals or funds? Now, this is um, something that, uh, it depends. It's not always straightforward, but it varies case by case. Being a fund manager, this is uh, dear to my, heart, to my heart. I think fund is one of the most elegant vehicles, but not every deal is like this. But I wanted to kind of stress out the difference. So when you do a single deal, you have a risk concentration and high volatility. In other words, if that one deal doesn't go right, you will have a lot of money tied in that deal. When you put the money in the fund, you have lower volatility and better diversification. The, uh, typically, a single deal might have a much worse liquidity th than a uh, uh, fund. 
So an example, you went into the deal that we are looking in on a fund level, the same deal, the self-storage deal. Your money will be frozen in that deal for two to three years. You basically have low liquidity. You're stuck until the deal goes through the life cycle. When you put the money in the fund, you have an emergency redemption request to come back and you say even three months down the road after you put the money. You're not supposed to pull the money out, but you have an emergency. You got to pull half the money out. You come to me, we're going to work, work on this and, and redeem your, your units because you have an emergency. Um, uh, personal guarantee may be required on individual deals on a final level, no. I mean, this is to the point where we're looking at the deal. I, I am, uh, we're negotiating how do we avoid the, the potential for the fund to, uh, to sign. So first of all, we're looking for non-recourse loan. Second of all, if the, there's a requirement to sign on something, we will avoid it. We will figure out a way to how to structure equity as an option to avoid deciding on the deal. Anyway, uh, potential liability risk for individual deals is very limited liability risk, risk in the fund. The investment could be active. Uh, if you are participating uh, in, in a given deal directly, you may have to be active while you're in the fund completely passive. Uh, another interesting difference is um, if you have uh, deals, even in the hard money space, you put your money on a deal and the money came back. At that point, the money is idle. So you don't have full utilization of money. When the money's in the fund, they're always working. I've hit that problem a number of times with short duration deals. Just be aware that it can happen. Uh, IRA investors could be at risk of UBIT or UDFI when leverage deals uh, not on a fund. If you, put a, if you put your IRA money in a fund like ours, there's no leverage on a fund level, there should be no UBIT. And the other important element is uh, just-in-time money. So if you find a deal, uh, you must have the right amount of money. If you have too little, you can't take it down. If you have too much, you're gonna have idle money. And a fund is very flexible. You can reinvest the net to the investment. Those are the big differences. Uh, a little bit about our fund. This is uh, from the last snapshot. It's a, it's a growth and income fund or more, more income and growth fund. We focus on value add equity investments uh, and fix and flip hard money loans. The PREF is seven, target 10 to 13. As you can see here, we've been running well above the target. Now I'm gonna set very realistic expectations. Uh, I'm coming down to earth and I want expectations to be much more realistic than the 13. If we run above that, it doesn't mean it's gonna be in the future. We might, we might uh, perform better, L let it be a good problem to have. So at this point, we're trying to set very conservative expectations. Distributions in Q2, as you can see, distributions are running well above the PREF. So we've had, I've had conversations with a number of investors who uh, have actual, actual capital uh, in some deals they can pull out and they're gonna pay five and a half percent money, essentially borrow money from some other assets mm -hmm. and I wanna put the money in the fund. Now, I'm not gonna say I can't guarantee the high level of distributions, but we're certainly very focused to have distributions uh, well above the PREF. Now, I can't control it, but we, we, we will continue to basically focus on having strong distributions and over time, I'd like it to get to 10% and above on a quarterly basis. This is in addition to the growth component of the, of the value add portfolio. Now, all that said, this is what the numbers were in the last quarter. Uh, we have capital raising round now on, uh, actually happens today. We will, we're, we're certainly above 10 million at this point. So we're raising about a million and a quarter, probably a little over that actually. So we'll be, most certainly over $10 million uh, net asset value is at the end of the quarter, probably closer to 10 and a half. Distribution of the quarterly and, and reinvestments are allowed. Any questions? Uh, there was a question from John Harrison. Can you explain a little bit uh, about how the waterfall works uh, in, in syndications? The waterfall of syndication works very similar to the fund, that there is a preferred return. Typically, uh, let me go back and see if we can go back to it. So this is an example uh, of a classic syndication today in the value add retail strip plaza. Non-big box retail that are focused on service-oriented plazas, uh, defensive retail, let me put it this way. So typically there's a preferred return. And the most common today's environment is about 8% PREF. So they'll define cumulative PREF and it is, again, typically 8%. We do have some investments in uh, retail deals that have PREF of 10 and even 11. So uh, there's a waterfall. The fund manager will charge 1% annual fee. Uh, then there is a PREF. So uh, if essentially cash on cash, 
on an asset like this is is say 14 percent again the, the going in cap rate again john you you understand this this very well so going in cap rate is nine you add leverage roughly two uh roughly 60 65 percent leverage you get cash and cash in the low to mid teens so you could pay eight percent pref and one percent management fees and a little bit of expenses so from that perspective um, on a deal like that, the actual distribution could be, uh, you know, 10, 11 percent. So after the 8 percent prep is met, then there's a 70-30 split. This split, 70-30 kicks in uh, right, at, right above 8 percent. Does that make sense? So for every dollar that they make, 70 cents goes to investors and 30 cents goes to the uh, project sponsor or the operator. So, so yeah, like that explains it well. Um, and and I, I wanted you to do it that way. Thank you, Mike. Uh, and then John's kind of more specific question, which I'm not sure exactly how he's referring to this, but his question was, is if there is a delayed payoff to the investors, is this referred to as a waterfall? And um, I'm not sure if you, when you say delayed payoff, does that mean because of lack of an exit strategy, John, lack of ability to refinance? Uh, I'm not sure exactly. Mike, do you have any idea what he's sure. so it waterfall works the same way if they can't pay the pref just think of it this way our very first quarter of operation we were not able to pay pref we just okay. started yep. we were able to pay about two and a half percent on an annual basis the remaining uh four and a half percent of pref is due we were able to catch up to that two quarters later so the way it works is if you don't have a pref uh as a as a uh, fund sponsor or fund manager you, uh, you, you accrue it on the books as due, but you don't distribute it, you don't have the cash. Right. And then the cash becomes available. And the cash becomes available from operations, from cash flow, or it becomes available from refinancing, it becomes available from sale. You meet the PREF fully. So you catch up all the underpaid PREF. Right. Once you do that, then you essentially split everything about that 70-30. That's the waterfall. So um, uh, the waterfall, it can be uh, sometimes a little bit different for, I, I've seen interesting deals. I've seen where they say on cash flow it's 70-30, but on uh, appreciation it's 60-40. But for the sake of argument, I don't like those deals. I like it 70-30 straight up. Mm -hmm. Every dollar that goes through the waterfall, it's the same way, 70-30, period. John, did, did I answer your question or there's something else that I'm missing? Well, I think, no, I think, I think he said that that's good. He's got it now that the uh, catch up on the pref. Uh, it has to be, that's the whole it, point. That's the word cumulative means. If it's not cumulative, yep. imagine this. So uh, projects that, that have heavy value at the ground up construction or redevelopment of anything, self-storage, two years, there's no cash flow. If the prep is not cumulative, the 16% of return goes poof. Sure does. Sure does. Really good. All right. So, Mike, I, I knew and we talked about the fact uh, I knew your content would take us uh, over the top of the hour uh, and well into the second half. So. Uh, that's why we didn't want to take a whole bunch of questions, but I will tell folks on the call two things I would advise you to do. Um, we'll send out the recording of this. I would I would listen to it again at least one time, probably two more times at your at your convenience. As you do so, um, jot down additional questions you have uh, and just email them to Lindsay L I N D S E Y at freedomfounders.com. Uh, just throw your questions in, and we'll we'll come back and, and go deeper. Mike, you did a great job covering a lot of material tonight. Um, I'll just say this, uh, and again, I, I have no skin in the game with any of our trusted advisors. Uh, I, I just love the fact that people like Mike will show up and educate us and help us with looking at the overall picture of the economy, where the market cycle is. I like the funds uh, overall today, where based on where we are in the marketplace, uh, because it's it, it's a place where I want to be diversified. Also, I don't want to be involved, particularly today, in, in syndications, because if I go into a syndication, then I, I feel like I've got to go and, and be part of the due diligence team. And that's, like, that's a good thing to do if you're going to be a part of a syndication or one project. But, you know, I just don't have time. I don't want to do that. So I personally, this is my bias, I like being in funds because I know people like Mike uh, and some of our other trust advisors who are really good at this, uh, they, they're doing the work for me. They're doing that hard work. They know what they're talking about. They know what they're doing. And I feel like I've got a lot better, a more passive investment. Uh, with all the other benefits that Mike already laid out, I'll, I will not reiterate those. So again, syndication's the right time, right place. Uh, but man, there's too many people, as, as Mike said, there's a lot of uh, dumb money that's chasing deals 
right and left today and people that are getting that money as syndicators they're having to put it somewhere and I, and I see them Mike and you do too they're putting them a lot of times into deals that that are very very marginalized uh, and and I think that's a scary point to be as a fund manager you get a chance to look at a ton of deals and as you said you only underwrite uh, 25 percent or less and fund you know 10 percent or less so I like funds. Um, I just think it's a good place to be right now, and it's easier to, to, to be a participant in funds. So that's just my overall personal bias. Uh, but Mike, um, thank you very much for uh, talk, uh, what you went over tonight. And I, I think one of the key things I want to bring up, Mike, uh, and you showed it in terms of your due diligence, you look at the sponsor deal operator first. That's what I always say to people. I don't care if you're doing individual deals or syndications or, or whatever, but look at the person first. The person who's sponsoring or the boots on the ground operator, that's your number one. And then the, in the, uh, the asset itself and then under, underneath that would be the structure. Uh, Mike, you hit it just right. Um, you're, you're clearly you know, top of your class at, at, at what you do. And uh, we'll come back and, and, and do another one. Um, by the way, what's, what's the minimum uh, investment right now for Tempo? Is it 100000 100, That's correct. 100000 So, and again, there's opportunities within the financial, uh, within, within Freedom Founders to, to put together deals. Elites do this uh, more commonly, uh, but, but you, know, you can put, put money together, form uh, your own LLC. You know, we can help you. Help, I'm, I won't personally help you do that, but I can refer you to people who can. So if some of you want to aggregate some money and become uh, an A or maybe a B class investor and get the higher returns, that's another way to do it within a community like we have. So that's, that's something that's, that's available. If you have questions about that, um, let me know. And if some of you, uh, because you're friends already and you want to get together and quote pool some money in your own LLC, I can I can I can refer you to the person who can help you put that together. And then Mike can uh, take that LLC and, and and run with that as well into a. David, I'll add one more thing. So what we've been doing this, and we're going to consistently we're going to be consistent about this. So we've let folks. So we have husband and wife. Uh, husband invests. Let's use an example: three hundred thousand, and the wife's IRA. So husband's IRA and wife's IRA, each invest 300,000. We'll consider them as sort of a investment combined because they can't do it together. They can't help right. each other for the IRA purposes. Right. It's an IRA rule. But as far as we're concerned, we will give each one B units as if they were combined together 500,000 because we're trying to help um, to give them that benefit as if it were one IRA, but they can't help each other to cause right. grief on the IRA level. So we've done that. We've also done this with IRA and non-IRA funds. So again, they can't help each other, but if you have IRA funds and non-IRA funds, we'll manage them as a separate account as if it was one account for the unit class classification, but for uh, the sake of taxation and IRA compliance, we'll manage them as separate accounts. Okay, perfect. Okay. Perfect. All right, uh, we'll come back and do a, a follow-up. Uh, and so again, uh, send your questions after you review this uh, recording at least one time. Uh, come back with your questions and uh, we'll do a deeper dive, but uh, I, I, this is very educational. The whole thing was very educational tonight, Mike, so I wanna thank you. Thank you all for being with us. Uh, have a great evening. Uh, elites, I'll see you in uh, two, two nights from now uh, on our call, our, one of our first, our first Fast Track modules, so I'll see you all then. Uh, we'll continue to, continue to bring you Every one of you, uh, you know, high education because we want you to be uh, astute investors. We want you to know what you're doing, to be able to ask the right questions. No matter what you're investing in, uh, we want you to be be very educated about this. So we'll continue to bring more more people and more training like we've done with Mike tonight uh, throughout, and make that part of uh, part of your investment in Freedom Founders. So thank you all, Mike. Um, thank you for, for being thank with you. us tonight. Uh, everybody, have a good evening. You too. Have a great evening, everybody. Bye bye. Bye.